So anyway, if you guys want to go over with Tisha, she's put a lot of time and effort into setting up the lesson for you guys. So that will be awesome, and you guys will have a lot of fun. I know you will this morning. I think I know what she has planned, but I'm not sure because she always surprises me when she comes up with this stuff. So, All right, we're going to be looking at something different today. Um, we got through our Thanksgiving time and everything, and now we're starting into the Christmas season. So we're going to look at something a little bit different today, and that will be really good. Actually, you could have kept them. That's all right. Keep them up here. That's fine. Thank you. All right, so um, we're going to look at something different. Look at this. Somebody didn't do their job yesterday. I found one. I found one that was left over. No, I'm just kidding. But that's awesome. But yeah, it was so funny because after we saw it, I was like, oh, I'm going to keep that. I'll keep that as a souvenir for the, the thing that we did. That was our first float ever. And that's awesome. But um, anyway, so as I was starting to put this lesson together, I really got to thinking about something and it really started to hit me. So I'm going to give you guys a lot today that I think is really going to help you to kind of get into the Christmas mood. And, um, you know, as I started thinking about this, you know, December's a very interesting month, and Christmas is a really great time of the year. And the reason why is, if you think about Christmas, it's a time when everybody starts to forget about the past, right? How many of you forget about the past at Christmas time? You know, you got family coming over and all this kind of stuff. So you forget about the past, you quit worrying about the future, and everybody focuses on the present. Oh, or the presents. You guys didn't even get it, oh my goodness. Anyway, you forget about the past. Still on and everything's still okay, but you just spend a whole lot of time away. 
and it's amazing. And then you go and you buy gifts for all these different people, and sometimes your list seems to just get so long, right? And you're sitting there trying to figure out all this stuff, but you still go and you get these gifts and you give them out. And what happens when they get the gift and they open it? They're so excited. And it makes you just feel so good about what you just did. Just because you got to bless someone and put a smile on someone's face. And it's amazing how that happens. So let's look here in this scripture right here. In Proverbs 11, 24 through 25. And it says, There is that scattereth, or there's people that scatter, and yet increaseth. So they scatter their stuff out, they give their stuff away, and they help other people, and yet they increase. How interesting is that? And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, the people that don't give anything out, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Here's something interesting as we look at this. Now, if you have an NIV, it really says a lot different than that, and it'll make a little bit more sense, so I'm going to try to break this down. But there's these people that take and they just seem to give away. Have you ever met those people? They just seem to give away and give away, and they always have so much. And then there's the ones that hold on to everything, and they don't give anything away, and they lead to poverty. As I got to thinking about that, I got to thinking about something, I got to thinking, at first I was thinking poverty, right? In my mind, I'm thinking poverty. But have you ever noticed someone that keeps everything and sometimes they have a lot? But what do they really have? Poverty. Spiritually. Because inside sometimes, even though they're, you know, they have so much, they're still miserable sometimes. So sometimes you can have a lot because you hold on to everything that you have and you're still in poverty. Even though your bank account doesn't say that, you are bankrupt. And I've seen a lot of people like that. Have you ever met someone who just seemed to have it all, and yet they were just absolutely miserable? Have you ever met people like that? You know, I got to thinking about this, and I was like racking my brain on this whole thing, and I'm like, you know, have you ever thought for a second, you see these movie stars, and you think, man, if I could just trade my life with them for a day, just for a day. Just to have an extra three, four hundred thousand dollars in my bank account. Just to have another car in the driveway. Just to have this or that or the other thing. And sadly, some of those people that have millions in their bank account take their own life. So sometimes, even though you may have a lot, if you're not experiencing what it's like to be generous, you may still end up bankrupts. Your bank account may not say it, and you may not feel it so much, but on the inside, you are absolutely bankrupt. It's amazing that this could possibly happen. Sometimes we chase these things around because what the world focuses on, what the world looks at, is a lot of this, and a lot of substance of what you have. It, and when I started to think about this, I started to think about how bad the world has gotten, because what does the world really focus on? If you look out in the world and you don't look at here, and you're out in the world, what do they focus on? It's all about you. It's all about you. You need to do this for yourself and do that for yourself, and it's all about all these things that you're doing for yourself. Well, where have we lost ourselves? Because if you think back in the scriptural Bible times, what did the people really do? It's all about giving. You know, you didn't have so much. And it was amazing because I got to looking at this and started to think about what people did back then. You know, if you needed a house built or if you needed a place to stay, they all came together and built your house for you. And then you went and helped them, you know, tend their fields and all that kind of stuff. And people were just so generous. And as I was growing up as a child, that's the way it was where we lived at. Everyone seemed to help everyone. And it's amazing now how you don't even know your neighbor next door. We've gotten to the point where we just don't even want to get outside and to meet people anymore. And it's crazy that it's got like that. Think about this, though, too. Have you ever given something to someone and your spirit inside of you just jumps for joy? I think of that scripture where John was, you know, was being, was, you know, they were pregnant with John and, and they, the spirit jumped inside of them. I think about that. Because can you imagine, you know, when you give somebody a gift, you, you get that feeling, right? Where your spirit almost jumps for joy. You get excited. Especially when you see the smile on their face when they open it up and they're like, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I wanted. And it gets you so excited. But the question is, do we really embrace that thought? Do we really embrace the thought of how it is that your spirit jumps inside of you when you give things away? 
So point one is, and if you think about this, is it's, a, it's a cure for selfishness because as you give things away, you really get this amazing feeling and it feels so good inside of you. But that brings me to point number two, which is tied to this and it's going to use the exact same, exact same scripture I used before. And that is, when you give, you also receive. When you give something away, you also receive something. And you may be sitting there thinking, no, I don't know about that. But think about this. What did we just talk about? When you give something away, what happens? Your spirit becomes so full, right? Your spirit just gets, you, you feel so good inside about what you've just done. And let's all be honest for something for a second. We're in here, the doors are closed, right? Nobody can see us from the outside and all that. It's just us here. So let's just be honest together for a second. The question is, would you rather have a full spirit and be genuinely happy? Or would you rather have a full bank account? Think about that for a second. Would you rather have a full spirit, give something away, and yet maybe it may cost you a little bit, your bank account may go down a little bit, but would you rather have a full spirit and be completely happy and be completely satisfied or have a full bank account? Now with a full bank account, it could come happiness, right? But it could come with a bankruptcy of your spirit, which is more important. Now, I would be the first to admit, you know, you know, when I used to work doing auto glass and all this kind of stuff, people would come to me all the time and they'd be like, you know, well, money isn't everything. You know, the scriptures say that, you know, money is the root of all evil. And I'm like, no, no, the scriptures say the love of money is the root of all evil. But everywhere I go, people want it, right? So it is nice to have a little bit. I'm not saying that we're not supposed to, you know, we're supposed to give away everything that we have and be poor, but be spiritually happy. No, that doesn't make sense. We're supposed to be good stewards with what? According to the scriptures, with everything God gives us. And we know that it's from God because God gives us everything. But at the same time, it's so nice to be able to give out to someone because when you give to someone, then you feel your spiritual account to some degree. You start to feel like excited about what you're doing and it maybe brings a sense of happiness. How many of you can say when you give a gift and somebody opens it, you're upset? You don't get upset, right? When you give someone a gift and they open it, what does it do? It brings joy and happiness. And you see the smile on their face, and it's amazing how that impacts other people. But let's look again at Proverbs 11 and verse 25, and look at the end of it. It says, He that watereth shall be watered also himself. He that watereth shall be watered also himself. Who is this talking? This is the Bible. And it makes a promise here. If you help other people and you encourage other people, what is the promise here? That you're going to be watered also. Did you know if you start to look in the scriptures, there's tons of scriptures. The Bible is riddled with this stuff all over the place. It talks about if you give, you will be given, and the meek shall inherit the earth. And it talks about all these different kinds of things, right? It talks about a lot about how if we give to someone else, then everything will be given to us, right? So we see tons of scriptures like this. But as I got to thinking about this, I started looking up in the strong screen court and started really tearing this down because I'm like, this is interesting. I said, you know, you know, as I started looking at that, I started thinking, well, you know, how many times does it come up in the Bible where it talks about how we're, you know, if we give out, we'll be given things back. And so as I started doing that, I started looking at a bunch of other things too, and I tied all this together. But you know, the topic of generosity is, is spoken of more in the scriptures than most of the other topics that we talk about in the church, that the church would consider important. So let me go this way. How many of you would think that the word believe in the scriptures is an important word? Pretty important, right? Did you know that the word believe is only used 272 times in scriptures, or approximately 270? That's it. 272, is that a lot? That's a lot, right? That's a good number. That's a big number. Sometimes I'd like to have that in my bank account. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, 272 is not bad. That's a good number, right? That's not bad. 272 is a good thing. Pray. I think pray is pretty important. The word pray is used 371 times. So pray is used a little bit more. The word love. What do you think about love? Probably pretty important. 
714 times. That's almost three times what believe is, and a little bit, almost double what pray is. How many times do you think give or generosity is used? 2,162 times. Look this stuff up. It's amazing. Pull this stuff down and start to realize. You know, the thing is, sometimes we in the church, we get caught up in like little things, you know? The scriptures tell about it. Remember when we were doing our, I think it was Matthew, we got to talking about how they would, you know, choke themselves over the, the silly little things and let all the big things pass by? Well, sometimes I think we get caught up in this too. We talk about, oh, this sin's bad and this is bad and that's bad and all this kind of stuff. Where's the generosity? Because it feels like in America we're starting to lose this sense of generosity. Is it just me, or are we really losing this? So I started to think about this, and I'm like, wow, you know, God really had it down. He wanted to teach us something. He wanted to teach us it's better to give than to receive. If he puts it in there 2,162 times, and we get caught all in, oh, we need to believe this, and you need to believe that, and you need to love this, and you need to, you know. Well, maybe we should be starting to think about giving, and maybe the love and everything else and the believing would come along with it. If we started to be generous to the people that, you know, are around us and all that kind of stuff, how many of you, if you really were to sit and think about it, would sit there and say, hmm, if I took a box of cookies to work, really good ones, my favorite, and I can eat them too, and I gave them to the people around me, maybe they would come to church. Or maybe if I did this, or maybe if I did that, maybe if I just put a little bit more time into this, it ain't going to cost me a whole lot. You can make no-bake cookies. You don't have to bake them. I'm good at that. I can't bake very good. But I can make no-bakes. If I bake, I burn things. No, I'm actually a pretty good baker. Tisha will tell you, but I'm not that good. But I can make no bakes, and I can make cereal, and I can make pizza. That's, that's really good. good All right, so anyway. Three essentials. <laughs> I can do three essentials. I can have cereal now. Anyway, and I can make macaroni and cheese, so I really make it. All right, so anyway. So it's really interesting, though, how it, you know, we know the phrase, and we know it's better to give than to receive, but have we really embraced it is the question. Step number three. It deepens and strengthens your relationships. I don't even think I need to tell you some of this stuff. You should know this right there. You know, it's amazing how when you give something, you really start to strengthen and develop a relationship. Think about this. How many of the times have you ever walked to the mailbox? And you're walking out to the mailbox, and you get there, and your whole way out there, because you got a long driveway, right? So your whole way out there, even if it's only five steps, it seems so long. Because you're walking out there, and you're like, and you get all the way out there and you put your hand on the mailbox handle and you're like, yeah, I'll just leave that there. I'll come back and get it tomorrow, right? But then you open the mailbox and you take it out, right? And it's not your birthday. It's not Christmas. It's not Thanksgiving. It's just a random day. And all of a sudden, there's a letter or a card in there. How many of you ever had that? You just randomly got a card pop in your mailbox from someone that you never expected to get a card from. How does that make you feel? I love to do that to my sister because I love my sister to death. And I'll just send her cards at random times and it's amazing. But here's what happens, right? When you get that random card or that random letter, it's simple. How much did that cost them? The stamp was probably more than the letter in the envelope itself, right? So you send this card or this letter or whatever out to someone. And then, you know, what happens immediately as soon as they get it? They call you. I'm glad someone said that. They call you. You just strengthen and develop the relationship. You know, because as soon as they get this little simple letter, they're like, wow, this is out of nowhere. Where did this come from? And you're so happy, right? Does it make you happy? Of course. And so you get excited. And then you pick up the phone. Hey, I got this letter from you. What made you decide to write this letter? I just want to let you know I was thinking about you. That is so nice. And you get in this long conversation. You thank him so much. And when you get done, you go and you sit down on the couch, probably, right? And you sit there and you look at this letter and you're like, that was so nice of and you start to think about this. And every time you see that letter, three months down the road, a year down the road, all of a sudden you see it still sitting there on your, you know, dresser or wherever you end up putting it at. And every time it sparks this thought, man, they just love me so much that they sent me a letter for no reason in the middle of nowhere. If we started just randomly sending letters to people, doing little things, just think how much it would develop and strengthen our relationship. Would that improve your life? Would it improve your life to have that? That's the third way that it will improve your life. Now there's a reverse side of this too. And it's 
found in James 2, 15 and 16. You don't have to go there. I'll read it to you. And the reverse side of this says, If a brother or a sister be naked or destitute of food, daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding the them, I mean, notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, but does it profit? So if someone comes to you and they say, Hey, you know, I don't have clothing, and I really don't have any food. Could you help me out, maybe a little bit? And you say, what the scripture says here is, it says, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. <laughs> but you don't give them anything. <laughs> what good did it just do? I know, have you ever had that happen? Oh, I'll, I'll pray for you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, think on the flip side, because this is the flip side, this is the negative. On the positive, what if somebody said that to you? Or they said, hey, I'm so sick, and I just don't feel good. Have you ever had somebody drop by a hot soup? put it on your door and drive off and then call you. Hey, I just dropped someone on your door. Go check it. Isn't that awesome? It is so great when that happens. I've done that before. I've taken and just, you know, drop soup off at someone's house and then just, you know, or shoot them a text message. Hey, there's something on your doorstep. I think you should check it out. It's amazing how far that goes. But if you just tell them, oh, okay, yeah, well, you know, go in peace and be warmed and you'll be okay. It doesn't do them any good, right? It's not going to do them any good at all. We need to be doing the things that are actually going to fill them up, and in the return, it'll fill you up. In Luke 8, 19 and 21, we talked about this. In Luke 18, 19 and 21, it's amazing. This was really, it just blew my mind. Because Christ, went, and we talked about this when we were in our Sunday night Bible study, or Wednesday night, I don't know which one, because they all just run together. In the movies. But it's awesome. But, you know, but we never forget the scriptures, right? What happens? Christ is in this crowded room. There's tons of people around. And he's all crowded and people are pressing on him from every side. And these people come up to him, hey Jesus, Jesus, hey your mom and your brothers are outside. What's his response? Who are my mothers and who is my mother and my brothers? Anyone who does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sisters. The point I wanted to make here is, it says in verse 15, if a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of food, is that your family only? Because who is Christ's mother and brother and sister? Anyone who does the will of God. So if they, and your family, and pretty much anyone really, as long as you know. Now, here's the flip side. Let's think about this. The person that sits at the end of the corner of your neighborhood that constantly is down in the bottles and he's got a sign that says, need money, will, you know. Should you give him money? No. Think about that. Now, should you help them out? Yes. Mm -hmm. Here's the difference. You can take them warm food and take them out some food and all that kind of stuff and sit with them. And if they throw the sandwich back at you like, I want money, then you know right away. You know, they're just looking for the next bottle. But if you take them food and they're like, thank you so much, then what did you just do? Think about it for a second. What did you just do? You created an opportunity. You already know there's a need there, right? Because they need what? If they're finding the answers in the bottom of the bottle, they need an answer. And you just created an opportunity to give them the answer. If you gave them the money, the opportunity's gone. But if you give them a nice meal, or you take, or it's a cold night, right? It's cold out. We know what it was cold like to be cold now, don't we? <laughs> you know, we were out there riding around in the back of a trailer. We know what it was like to be cold. But if, so if you take them a warm blanket and just wrap it around them, and just sit, you know, sit there and talk with them, do you know the love of God will wrap you just like this blanket? Think how far that will go to someone sitting on the street trying to find the answer in the bottom of a bottle. It'll go a long way. And you'll really be able to make a difference and make a huge impact in their life. And the thing is, if we start to do these kinds of things, granted we can't give them money and we know that. A lot of times people sit there and you know you feel so bad when you see them and you drive past them and you think, man, I could give them like a dollar or two dollars. No. The next time you see that, go to the next place and take the dollar and turn it in for a sandwich. And take them a sandwich and then take five minutes to sit and talk with them afterwards. You know, the amazing thing is the other day, just not that long ago, I don't know how many of you may have seen this, but on Facebook a video popped up. And I got to look at it. It was amazing. And it showed that they, they, they were doing an experiment. And so they walked into this um, pizza restaurant, which, you know, if I was in a pizza restaurant, I wouldn't share my pizza Either, but I'm going to probably eat it all and be gone. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so, but they were sitting in a pizza restaurant. There's people sitting there and all this kind of stuff. And this bum walks.
walks in dressed as a bum. He wasn't really, but he wanted to, you know, go and see what people would do. So he walks in, you know, he looks like he, you know, is living on the street. He walks in and he, you know, walks up to a table and he says, hey, can I have a piece of pizza? No, 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 no. Go away. Hey, can I have a piece of pizza? Hey, this guy's pestering all your, all the people in here and he's wanting some food. Can you kick him out? Do you know they put him out of the restaurant? Because he was looking for a slice of food. Something to warm his belly and to feed and fill him up. Think about this. On the flip side, they took a person that genuinely had no money and was living on the streets and they gave him a pizza. And then they took this guy and dressed him up really nice and sent him out to talk to the guy that had the pizza and asked him for a slice of pizza. You know what he did? He gave them a slice of pizza without asking a question. He just walked up to him kind of arrogantly, dressed nice, flipped the script. A nice dressed guy walks up to someone that looks like they may not have anything and asks him for a slice of pizza, and he gave it to him. He need, who needs the pizza more? So it's amazing how sometimes the people that have the smallest amount are the quickest to give. But we need to start flipping the script too. We need to start being the ones when we see someone there. A hot sandwich is all they need sometimes. And, and you know what? It opens an opportunity for you to be able to sit there and say, hey, you know what? This hot sandwich can fill your stomach for a moment, but I can give you something that will fill your spirit for a lifetime. And it gives you a chance to be able to share a word. Let me ask you a question. Would that improve your life? Think about that. Number four, how else will it improve your life? It will strengthen your faith. It will strengthen your faith. Being generous will strengthen your faith. It's amazing how, if we start to think about this one, how many of you know that if you give away, sometimes it'll really strengthen, strengthen your faith? You know, we talked about tithing and things like that the other day, but you know, this is a little bit different. You know, we know that it's a responsibility to give to the church, right? We know it's our responsibility to pay our bills. We know it's all the... How much harder is it now to step out sometimes and to just give to someone who really is in need? Sometimes the number one way that God will test your faith is through finance, through generosity, and through giving. If you've never experienced it, oh, you will. Because that's the one way God will test your faith. More, and, I, and I'm not saying that's the number one way God will test your faith, but I'm sure certain it's one of the quickest ways He will. Through your finances, God will test how strong your faith really is. I'm not even going to kill that one. Because I think that just makes sense. And I will be honest with you, I don't think there's a person in this room that would not be willing to say that finances and giving is the number one way that God will test your faith. So I don't even think I need to kill that Here's an amazing, and I want to save the time for this. There's a reason why. Number five, how will generosity improve your life? It makes you more like God. Now, can we ever be like God? Not 100%. But how many of you would love to be more like God? Exactly. Think about this. As a parent, my mother used to always, you know, talk about, you know, all these different things. And she would, you know, she had 11, 11 kids, you know, seven girls and four boys. So it was amazing because she always had the answers to everything. You know, it was really, really interesting how all this, you know, shook down. But as I was growing up, I learned so many things from my mother. And one of the things was she would always give to us first over everything else. Well, one day I'm driving in the car and... How many of you know McDonald's is really good for you? Well, it's really not. But sometimes we have to go there. I'm telling you, the other day we went to McDonald's, we hadn't been eating fast food at all for a while. And we stopped by and we ate McDonald's. And before we got home, all three of us were sick. I mean, our stomachs were just turning. It's amazing. Now, back in the day, I used to eat McDonald's every day. And it was great. And I would be able to stomach that. But after you get on a healthy diet, when you put that in your stomach, it would make you sick. Trust me. So it was amazing. But think about this, though. One day we had stopped by and we, we got some french fries, right? And got, I mean, we got, a food, we got food for Stephanie. We went, wanted to pick her up a little meal and everything. 
So we get Stephanie this little meal and everything, and so I've got it beside me. Well, one of the things, one of the rules in our house is we just don't eat in the cars, ever. So we just like to keep, you know, the food out of our cars, because otherwise, it, you know, you'll find french fries that are all folded up along the, you know, the edge of your seat and all kinds of stuff. I mean, they end up everywhere. How they get there, I'll never know. Because you never drop them, but all of a sudden they end up there. But it's so interesting. Or you'll find a sandwich sometimes. I, mean, and I don't know, I've never done that, but I'm sure they will. But anyway, so... But, you know, one day we stopped and we picked up Stephanie some food, and you could smell it. It smelled so good. And those McDonald's fries smelled so good, right? They smelled so delicious, right? And so, as I'm sitting there, and you know, we're driving home, I can smell these, this food, and it smells so good. Because that's what they do. That's their ploy. That's what they get you. They make it smell really good, and they make it taste really good, and nutritionally it's not worth anything. But anyway, so... I reach over and I reach down to the bag and I get a french fry and I go to stick it in my mouth and just as I get it about right here, Stephanie goes, you can't do that, that's my fry. You can't eat that french fry, that's mine. And I was like, oh. so now it caught me off guard because I'm like, I bought her these french fries. But then all of a sudden these three thoughts start running through my head. I started thinking, wait a minute, you're not paying the bills yet, those are my french fries. I bought those french fries. They came from my money. I bought them with my money. I don't have to give you any fries. As a matter of fact, I could never buy you fries ever again if I really wanted to because it's my money. And those fries are my fries, right? That was the first thought. The second thought is, that's fine. I'll just go get more. For a couple dollars, I could get myself a super-sized fry. You can have your puny little happy little size fry. And I'll get a super-sized one. And I'll have all the fries I want because it's my money and I'm the daddy and I can go get all the fries I want. The third thought that went through my head though was, I'm the father, I have the money. I love you so much that I can go back and get you all the fries you could ever want. An endless supply of fries. <laughs> that would probably be a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a very bad idea. But you want to know something? God operates under step three. God desires to give you, look it up in the scriptures, it says it specifically, the desires of your heart. God wants to give all of you an endless supply, the desires of your heart. He wants to give that to you. Why is it not there? Who's in the way? There's someone else that's in the way. It's not God. Because the scriptures tell us that God's desire is to give you all the desires of your heart. All of the desires of your heart. And if we follow what God's telling us to do, and we're giving and we're doing the things that we know that God is telling us to do, then we know that God is going to bless us with all the desires of our heart. So the question is, who's in the way? That's the real question. When we give, we are not only doing what God would do, we're acting the way God would act. Everything that we have is whose? It's God's. It belongs to Him. He's the one sitting there with a bank account that says, I can give you an endless supply of whatever you want. Want an endless supply of French fries? That could have been around the waistline, but I'll give them to you. You can have all you want. You know, like, but whatever it is, like, I'm sure He's not going to do that. Again, that's not how God operates, but He gives you the things that you need. And he gives you an endless supply of everything that you want. So when we start to give, what are we doing? We're becoming more like God would be. John 3.16 talks about this. It talks about the first Christmas gift ever. We see two things in John 3.16. The first one is that God the Father gave his only son to you. He sent him here. God the Father sent his only son to this earth to be with you. The second thing we see is Christ came here to give the ultimate sacrifice of his own life for you. When we start to give back, we're starting to, then what happens is, Jim, you and Sarah can come up. When we start to give back, we are starting to become more like what Christ would be. Think about what he did. He didn't just give us french fries. God sent Christ to be here with us as a gift of us. Christ gave his life as a gift for you. He was willing to not only give a little bit, 
not only sacrificed a, you know, a part, but when it came down to it, he stood in a garden and he prayed a prayer. God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nonetheless, your will be done. Christ said, I, this is hard, but I have a gift that I can give and it includes my life. And I'm willing to lay down everything I have to give you a free gift. All you have to do is take it. When we give, we become more like Christ. 2 Corinthians 9.15 is the final verse I'm going to wrap this up with. And it says, thanks be to God for his unspeakable or indescribable gift. God gave us an ultimate gift. When we start to give and we start to, you know, operate with a sense of generosity, we become more like God. If you think about these five things, would that improve your life? That's the question I have for you today.